not only the students, but also the faculty are talented and vibrant. Congratulations for your wonderful initiation. We are in pandemic. Coronavirus disease is an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered coronavirus. WHO published our first disease outbreak news on the new virus on 5th January 2020. It announced that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic on 13th March 2020. It is almost four and a half months have gone. The entire world kept quiet right from 13th March. No one knows what to do, but we have to find out. As an academician, we have to find out how to overcome these kind of hurdles and problems that the entire humanity is expecting now. Anything thing, we have to check it in positive sense. We have to adapt ourselves for any situation. God gave a chance to think about our future. Yes, it's a God-given break in the past and furious and digital world. This is an exercise to all to face tomorrow's world. COVID-19 will reshape our world. We don't know when the crisis will end, but we can be sure that by the time it does, our world will look very different. Let's all face boldly the tomorrow's world. In this kind of situation, many departments in our college came forward to conduct webinars workshops, seminars, conferences for the benefit of their students, faculty, and also to the researchers and public. Likewise, the English department is organizing their second uh, third international webinar series on the Meet Your Author, an interactive session with Jayshri Misra. As I said earlier, wisdom begins with wonder, the same by Socrates. The whole academicians are focusing on online education now. I do appreciate the efforts of English department for organizing such a useful webinar. Friends, I am happy to inaugurate the international webinar series on Meet Your Author, an interactive session with Jayashree Misra, organized by the English department of the American College to their students, faculty, researchers and public during the lockdown period past the coronavirus pandemic. It is my pleasure to thank again the resource person, Jayshree Mishra, for accepting our request. Hope this will be a useful one. Once again, I congratulate the faculty, SFED, Dr. Paul Jaker, webinar coordinator, Mr. Daniel Rubaraj, assistant coordinators, Ms. Charanya, Mr. Joshia Manuel, Ms. Sabinaya, and PG and Research Head, Dr. John Shager, for their wonderful initiative. God bless. Thank you, sir. Next, I welcome Dr. Stanley Mohandas Stephen, former head research department of English, to introduce the department activities to us. Thank you, Charanya. Uh, do you hear me? Do you hear me? You hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, oh, sir. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Respected Principal Dr. Dominic Christopher, Dr. John Shager, Chair, Research Department of English, Madam Jayashri Mishra, creative writer of Great Renown and the star of this webinar, coordinator Professor Daniel Ruberaj, all of our love, loving uh, uh, assistant coordinators, Professor Nedumaran. Professor Yelango, Dr. Savio, Dr. Paul Jayaker, and all my esteemed colleagues in the Department of English, colleagues from various other colleges, most importantly, researchers and student participants of this webinar. Pleasant evening to all of you out there in this part of the world, and a very special sunny noon to uh, Jesh Sri Man. I'm extremely happy to welcome you all to this first webinar series titled meet your other. We had the privilege of hosting a number of writers in the Department of English right from 1982 onwards. Dr. Ayyapa Panikar, 
Dr. Prema Nandakumar, Kamala Das, Sashi Desh Pandey, KK Daruwala, Anita Nair, Kaveri Nambizan, Magi Jachani, and Bama, to name a few. It's certainly a pleasure to have it's certainly a pleasure to have Madam Jayashri Mishra on board this evening. Let me quickly share with you the profile of the department. The, dep the Department of English is the biggest and the oldest department on campus. We have been teaching English language and literature since 1881, the year of inception of the college. The Department of English has been envisioned as a center of academic excellence, professional expertise, and active research in the field of English studies. As English studies has gone global, our core English curriculum has transcended the boundaries to include all literatures in English, films, sports, journalism, so on and so forth. In addition to the undergraduate, and the graduate programs, the young for the pre-doctoral program, and the doctoral program offered by the research department in English prepare students and scholars for active research in British literature, American literature, Indian literature in English, English language teaching, literary theory, literature of the Indian diaspora, and new literatures in English. In addition, we publish a research journal called AGGEL, A-C-J-E-L-L, American College, American College Journal of English Language and Literature. High standard has been maintained by the input offered by the, the brilliant faculty of the department. More than 10 faculty hold doctoral degrees and more another uh, 10 are in the final stage of the doctor research. The research department is also enriched by its libraries. The undergraduate department houses more than 5,000 books. The postgraduate uh, department library has around 15,000 books of high research value. Further, the Study Center for Indian Literature in English and Translation, popularly called Skillet, is a treasure trove of resources for researchers. Apart from these, the Daniel Poor Memorial Library of the college has a sizable number of books that interest students of English. Let me wrap this up by making a very special mention of the theoretical activities of the department, scripted, acted, and directed by eminent professors like Vasandan, Nedumaran, Yelango, Rajendra Pandian, Lawrence, Dinekar, and Abhinaya of the department. Of course, as a department, we believe in Robert Browning's dictum, the best is yet to be. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now, now I invite Professor R. Daniel Rupraj to introduce the resource person to us. Over to uh, I invite Professor Abhinaya to introduce the resource person to us. Over to, Over to Abhinaya. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Uh, yes. Yes, Abhi, you can. Thank you, Professor Charanya. It's indeed an honor and pleasure to introduce uh, the chief guest, Ms. Jayashree Misra. Jayashree Misra is an Indian author. She is a great niece of the late Takali Sivasankara Pillai, famous Malayalam writer and Nyanpit awardee. Mrs. Misra was born in Delhi. Her father was an officer in the Indian Air Force and her mother was a school teacher. Jayashree Misra grew up in India, moved to the UK in 1990. She has an MA in English Honours from Kerala University and subsequently acquired two postgraduate diplomas, the first from the University of London in Special Education and the second from the London College of Printing in Broadcast Journalism. Mistra worked for several years in the child care department of social services in Buckinghamshire and more recently as a film classifier at the British Board of Film Classification in London, England. She resigned 
At the end of 2009, after a seven year stint, when she went to live in New Delhi, India, where she helped to start up a residential project for adults with learning disabilities. The studio she built on Bailey Beach in Trivandrum, Kerala is being developed into a writer's residency. She currently lives with her family in the UK. Jayashree is a reg is regular on the literary part in the Jayapur River, the Daily Wi Festival, PK Festival in Kerala, the Povilam Festival in Odisha Literary Festival in Dubaneshwar, the Kushman Singh Literary Festival in Kasali, Panjshir Arts Festival, the Delhi Gymkhana Club Lit Festival, the Dhaka Literature Festival, the Matsubumi International Festival of Letters in Trivandrum, and the inaugural Kerala Literature Festival in Koyikode. She has also held events at the Frankfurt Book Fair and the Sharjah International Book Festival, and has been a part of the panel discussion at the London Book Fair. She was invited by the Arts House in Singapore to conduct creative writing workshops for adults and school children. She inaugurated the Kerlehi Samajam Book Fair in Manama, Bahrain, and led the pledge for International Women's Day at Technopark, Truvandrum. She has written eight novels, and the ninth one is a non-fiction, and it is a personal narrative about Kerala. She is a writer, Indian mentor, and shepherd many special needs children at a project called Vahani Scholarships. The research department of English, the American College, feels privileged to extend a warm welcome to Ms. Jayashree Misra. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very generous introduction. <laughs> it's a good reminder to me of the various places I've been to and the things I've done. And yes, I, I feel quite privileged and very blessed and exceedingly happy to be here with, with all of you today. I have to put on my glasses and look. Oh, it's another not few participants. Have, it's all very exciting for me. <laughs> Over to Professor Daniel Rukaj. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Abhinaya. Uh, once again, uh, a warm welcome to Ms. Jayashree Misha. I was accepted our invitation uh, to be part of this program. I welcome you, ma'am, on behalf of uh, uh, the Research Department of English. And uh, we have uh, a few questions uh, to ask, be asked to you. Uh, the first one, uh, shall we start the session, ma'am? Yes, please, please, looking uh, forward yes. to it. Yeah, yes, ma'am, very nice. and. Uh, just uh, I go with the first one. Great ideas may seem like single, definable, eureka moments. In reality, they tend to fade into view slowly. They are like gradually maturing uh, slow hunches, which demand time and cultivation to bloom. According to Darwin, the theory of natural selection simply popped into his head when he was contemplating Malthus's writing on population growth. But Darwin's notebooks reveal that far before this so-called epiphany, he had already described a very uh, nearly complete theory of natural selection. This slow hunch only matured into a fully formed theory over time. In the same way, from where did you get ideas for your first novel, Ancient Promises. Though it is a semi-autobiographical novel, were you contemplating on this for some time or was it a, a slow hunch at the back of your mind? Or was it a spontaneous overflow? I like that description very much actually because I think it, it, it does describe the process possibly that I went through when Ancient Promises was being researched somewhere in the deepest recesses of my mind. Um, under no circumstances was I, in all the years that I was living experiences that later came to be part of the book, um, was I ever contemplating actually, you know, sort of transforming all of this 
into some kind of narrative or some kind of story. I certainly wasn't seeing my life as a series of chapters. I can tell you that in all honesty. Uh, one doesn't live life like that. I think you just sort of get on with life and meet its various challenges and do the best you can. Um, as as um, Principal Sir said in the, in, in, in the opening remarks, um, we are at the moment, all of us living through times which are so unusual and so horrendous that uh, I don't think any of us at the moment, we're all in coping mode. We're all kind of just dealing with whatever comes before us day by day, hoping for the best, keeping fingers crossed, praying for loved ones and so on. But all of this, all of these experiences somewhere along the way, for some of us, for those of us who are, and I'm assuming that there's a lot of people in this audience who are uh, given to sort of um, translating their experiences into writing, into words. Mm -hmm. Um, the, all of this is likely to transmute somewhere along the way into some other form. So, you know, you, real life can transmute itself and become many different things. In some people, it just remains as memories, as you said, or as, as sort of hunches, things that just sort of sit there. But for other people, and I think for those of the writers amongst us, it's all kind of future material. And I think that was probably what was happening when I was living my, my younger days, when I was in my 20s, my teenage years actually, and then my 20s, um, and living those experiences, my early experiences of that life in Kerala. Um, I, was, I was definitely in coping mode. I was definitely just trying to get through whatever life was throwing at me. Um, and the, 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 the idea of actually writing, it wasn't an epiphany. And it wasn't a eureka sort of moment, um, whatever Darwin might have said. Uh, I think it was, it was something which gradually seeped into my consciousness many, many years after I had lived all those experiences. So a good 10 years had passed since that time. And I was by then living in London, working, a busy wife, mother, student, actually. I was studying at the time. Um, somewhere it seeped into me that possibly there was something I would benefit from by, by writing my experiences. I knew there was a lot of unresolved in me. And so I, I think the idea was conceived more as a, and I sometimes describe it as the letter of explanation. And I say letter of explanation to my husband uh, who was affected by some of these decisions. But I think it was also a letter of explanation to myself. It was a way of reasoning out for myself why I had allowed life and circumstance to to guide me in some ways which looking back I thought didn't seem like the natural thing for me so um, yeah I started definitely just writing something very personal writing for myself and then how that actually journeyed and became into something bigger into a book and mm -hmm. certainly a book which seems to have reached out to people in a way that still continues to astound me I I, I would have never dreamt of that of, of that journey for a, such a sort of personal, what was a personal exercise for me. Okay, okay ma'am, thank you. Thank you for your uh, clear explanation of your, your thoughts, uh, just, you know, uh, becoming uh, your novels. Uh, we just, uh, we have named our program as, you know, uh, uh, books uh, coming to life. So here uh, you just said how your life has become so my next question to you is uh, this, uh, Mandakini is the heroine of the first Indian novel, Raj Mohan's Wife, which was written by uh, none other than Bankim Chandra Chatterjee in the year 1864. Mandakini loves her sister's husband more than her husband. Janaki, the heroine of Ancient Promises, written in 2000s, she loves Arjun and not her husband. Do you think that marriage as an institution has abruptly failed in India? Why husbands are always considered as not so attractive? <laughs> I'm sorry if that is your experience. I certainly hope <laughs> not a universal experience. <laughs> 
no, from the from the from the Even first I'm novel muted, i can see a lot of appreciative laughter <laughs> for your remarks <laughs> actually you're not the first person to say this professor daniel there was there was um, a, a, a journalist here in the uk uh, who writes for a very um, a very british publication called the daily telegraph now when when penguin was promoting the book and obviously they put my name and they sent the, the proof copies out to various journalists this guy happens to be of indian origin um i I'll, i can tell you his name as well because um i'm sure he won't mind he's, he's after all, he's a journalist he writes publicly but his name is amit roy and he he writes in the paper he writes under a pseudonym so there's this particular column in which he had uh, described having met me and something about my book um it didn't actually go out under an indian name but i knew this was an indian i think a lot of people would have picked up on the fact that this was an indian man speaking <laughs> because when he interviewed me and that kind of bled a little bit into the interview but not in a big yeah. way but uh, when he interviewed me the first thing he said was uh do you realize uh, jayshree misra that you could be encouraging young women to go and sort of divorce their husbands and uh, you're writing a book which is very very for people who want to leave their husbands he was genuinely <laughs> agitated very worried about the effect that this book of mine was going to have on 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 generations of women and obviously it made me smile, laugh even then a bit like your question has now because <laughs> I'm not sure books alone can do that kind of thing. I think it takes a whole lot of um a whole lot of uh, circumstances to come together before someone takes a decision as major as that. There has to be quite a lot of things going wrong. And um sure, I think a writer and I think that's that in some ways is a sign of a of a good book or a powerful book. Certainly that's the books that I've read and appreciated and that have continue to mean something to me are those books that have opened a certain window in my mind that otherwise had just been shut with no prospect of opening up ever so there is always a possibility that a book will make you shift mentally sort of do a little side step or maybe more than that change your mind quite dramatically about certain things and so yes i mean i don't deny the possibility that a book uh, certainly that my book yeah. can it have had that effect but it's not it certainly wasn't one that i would have set out to do and i i have a lot of time for indian husbands i happen to be married to one <laughs> who's <laughs> very precious to me very dear to me yeah. he can't hear me so i can say this it's fine <laughs> he's in another face <laughs> we could have, we could have invited him also ma'am <laughs> you know this earlier No, no, no. I, I, I order him out of the room when I have okay. a something. So <laughs> okay, okay. He sets me up. He's my IT help desk. He'll kind of make mm -hmm. sure everything is running, and then I have to say I'm okay, and then he, he pushes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And uh, just Rani, uh, Rani, your next novel is the most powerful. Rani is the most powerful and strong woman among all the women characters of Jayshree Mishra. recreating a historical uh, character like rani is an arduous task but you have surpassed all the controversies and very beautifully presented the so far unexplored extramarital love affair of mani karnika with major ellis what is the basis of your estimate of the queen have you ever felt that you have belittled a woman who has been worshipped as an idol in india that's a very good question first of all i do need to clarify that you know when when the people describe the relationship that rani lakshmi bai has with uh, major ellis in the in the novel in my book um i i always shy away from this from the description of love affair because for anyone who has not read the book it seems to indicate something which is which the book actually steers quite clear of it's um, it was something that i was um i found myself wanting to be very careful about i mean and this is this is in an age before things became even more censorious than they are now um but i i um what i do show quite clearly is that um, rani lakshmi bai has 
sort of feelings, has emotions that she has to kind of put away somewhere because she knows that these feelings that she is beginning to develop for this man are not going to be helpful at all in her circumstances. If anything, is going to give her a lot of trouble, a lot of heartache. And so she makes a very conscious decision. Having, having, having put these feelings, extinguished these feelings within her, she makes a very conscious decision to focus on her state and on her child and on her uh, you know, developing the army with the help of her father. So she's, she's all of these things in my book. She's a mother, she's a daughter, she's a queen, she's a, a, a lover. I mean, she, she is married for some time, so she's a wife, but her husband was in reality much older than her and, and died within a few years of their marriage. This was Raja Gangadhar of Chansi. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you look at the research papers, there is a major Ellis who was the political agent of Jhansi state, the, the East India Company's political agent in Jhansi at the time. And he was actually very close to both Raja Gangadhar and to Rani Lakshmi Bai and continued to be close to the, to the Jhansi court even after Raja Gangadhar died, which is when everything fell into such an upheaval. When the, the governor general, Lord Delousey, sitting in Calcutta, decided that Jhansi's... Uh, that, that uh, Lakshmi Bai's adopted son was not a legitimate heir and therefore Jhansi could be taken into the um, into British territory. So um, all of this was happening while Major Ellis worked very closely with Rani Lakshmi Bai to actually assist and help her through this crisis. So this is all established historical fact. There was a man called Major Ellis. He wrote a very upset and very uh, angry letter to Lord Dalhousie, which is the, the letter is available in the British archives. Actually, the, the National Archives in Delhi also has some of the correspondence that took place. And the, Lord Dalhousie wrote a very angry letter back to Major Ellis as well. He, he was incensed by the whole idea that this British officer could be supporting an Indian queen. So all of that is established historical fact. And unfortunately, actually, very sadly, Major Ellis sort of disappears from view after that. And I tried my best to find out what happened to the real man. You know, I, I, to, in order to create a character in a book, it's quite helpful to know what, especially if it's historical fiction, you want to know what happened to the real mm -hmm. characters. But Major Ellis kind of disappears from view. There, there's a suggestion that he was punished and posted to Panna, but he was moved, he was taken away from Chansi. So just to, to, not to sort of ramble on too much about this, um, when in, in the genre of historical fiction, because since all of you are students and lovers of literature, these different genres come to mean uh, more than they would to just some average reader out there. You kind of, it's important in a way for us to know what's different between documented history and um, narrative nonfiction and actual historical fiction. These are all very separate sort of genres. So because I had chosen to write in the genre of historical fiction, I knew that I could do what I wanted with this information, but I also wanted to stay as true as possible to a likely series of events. So what I have in the book is Major Ellis being so uh, broken, really, by the whole experience and his, his interaction with Lord Delousey was such an unhappy one, that he boards a ship and comes back to England. And um, therefore, he's, he loses everything, loses his job, Jhansi, his friendship with the Queen. And that was it. So that was how I moved the story forward, because I didn't have enough information about him. So while she didn't actually, they didn't actually have a love affair, it is absolutely true that they had a lot of regard and time for each other. And it is also true that he laid his career on the line to help her. Now, why exactly a person would do that is not for any of us to kind of judge so many years down the line, he's not there to ask what was it that possessed you to give up your job and give up your prospects in India. He could have gone on to be quite a senior person uh, in the new administration, but yeah, he left all of that. Um, in my book, he comes back to England. What actually happened to him, of course, we will never know. And my, my next uh, question is, uh, Janaki, again, I go back to Janaki. Janaki was not, not <laughs> able to... character, <laughs> Yeah, yes. <laughs> Janaki was not able to accommodate herself with her groom's family from the beginning. And she finds solace in Arjun. Uh, Arjun was his, uh, her first love, okay? But in, 
uh, in another novel, uh, Maya was living with her husband for many years, well settled with her child. But what actually uh, uh, you know, she was living, Maya was living in Trivandrum, uh, unlike Janu, she is uh, not a, also highly educated. Uh, she does not seem to uh, be deprived of her uh, sexual desires also. Yet, all of a sudden, when Raghul Tiwari comes and he attracts her very much, uh, Please, uh, participants, please mute, uh, mute yourselves. Uh, how do you uh, define uh, the South Indian women psyche? Do the South Indian housewives really long for recognition? And are they dissatisfied with the way they are treated by their husbands and their family members? Is there an identity crisis in Noya? I have a feeling you're genuinely worried about this whole area, aren't you, <laughs> Professor Daniel? <laughs> We're going to, are we going to keep coming back to this, this particular yeah. problem with the novels of Jayshree Misra? <laughs> but uh, I'm sure you don't mind my, my, my making light of, of this. <laughs> Maya is a complex character. You're right. I, I can barely understand her myself, to tell you the truth. Uh, people read that book, it's, this is a book called Afterwards, um, which was actually, in all honesty, written sometime soon after Ancient Promises was completed mm -hmm. and sent off to the publishers. So people accuse the book of being a bit of a spillover book. I, you know, calling it a sequel is a bit of a nonsense because the characters have different names and they're different. But there's a sense of a spillover from Ancient Promises in that the characters, you can find resonances with the characters of the previous book. Now, in order for this, because I was aware when I wrote it, I was aware of the fact that there was sort of some elements that were a little bit similar to um, Ancient Promises. So what we did, my I had a chat with my agent and I wrote a book, a very light, very silly, actually, uh, sort of comedy mm. of manners called Accidents mm. Like Love and Marriage, which no, yeah, yeah. no mm. reputed institute of higher learning ever talks about. <laughs> so, uh, so I hope you don't have any questions lined up for me on that. But I wrote that book in, deliberately to sort of sandwich between these two books that were otherwise going to seem a bit too similar to each other. So Maya is a bit of a spillover character from Janaki, from Janu of Ancient Promises. Mm. And she has some of, she, Janu has lost her innocence somewhere along the way, I think, when she became the Maya yeah, character. She's become more, more hard-bitten, a little bit more self-seeking uh, mm. character. And maybe this was the journey that I was beginning to think was, in, you know, somewhere an important journey for most women to make. I mean, my, mm. my books are read as sort of feminist tracts as well. So if... Mm. if in the question, I assume that there's a little, there's an element of your, you're trying to pierce through this to find out how much of the feminist thought is there. Yeah, yes. Women being dissatisfied with their domestic situations and wanting to do something to, you know, to sort of um, actively sort of remove themselves from those dom unhappy domestic scenarios. So, yes, I think as the growing feminist that I was at the time, you see, I had left India, moved to the UK. I started a new life here. I myself was developing my ideas about life and about myself and about my place in the world as a woman. So I think some of these feminist ideas were creeping into my writings as well. And that definitely Maya is a more sort of feminist so version of, okay. of John. And we move on to the next novel. Uh, as a writer, how do you look at uh, the, uh, the premarital affairs and the adoption? Are they really sins or a postmodern way of life? Are you talking about two separate things, premarital affairs? Uh, and premarital affairs and adoption, uh, which you have mentioned in one of your novels. Adoption comes into one of the very uh, the later ones, the secrets. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, secrets uh, and sins. Yeah, yeah that's it. Uh, you, you, secret. both uh, secret and sins and scandalous secret. Uh, they deal with these things, uh, children, 
and yeah. do you do you still think that these things are premarital and postmarital affairs or sins um the the titles of those books were actually chosen by the publishers so i had nothing to do whatsoever with the title with the mm. idea that sins comes into the mm -hmm. title yeah because uh, the, the title doesn't sync well with the uh, with the idea which you represent there in the novel absolutely right because what i am in secrets and sins what i am trying to do is yes it is largely about um about adultery and about um trying to expose trying to show the pain and the anguish that it that that can be sparked by yeah. by those yeah. sort of actions i was there was no way i was going to get into the whole moralizing attitude of whether it's a sin or not but because the publishers had already sort of it was commercial fiction and the publishing uh, the, the the editor who had actually commissioned these books uh, wanted because it was a three book sort of series not quite a series but um, a yeah. three book yeah. deal which she had done with me uh, she wanted some kind of a theme so th unfortunately the theme then became secrets and then she because it was secrets and lies she suggested secrets and sins and then we had a scandalous secret mm -hmm. so um the sins only came into the title because it sort of matched <laughs> which is and and i suppose yeah the editor must have been thinking a bit like possibly you are is that after all it is a book about adultery and about illicit love affairs so there is i mean a lot of people would would use mm -hmm. words like sin to describe that but in in my case i i i'm very conscious of the fact that i don't want to use my books to moralize i think that's not the intention with which i write i write mm -hmm. simply because you know, i have the story pushing away inside me and it's something has to be done with them and so the easiest thing for me is to put it down and make it into a book but mm -hmm. um the idea of adultery as a theme for that book was quite deliberate quite conscious and i'll tell you this because you know it's if there is curiosity about where stories come from and where characters come from you are all students of literature mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. this is all these are the kind of areas that i know fascinate the literary mind um it was quite simply the fact that as i grew into my 40s my mid 40s i was surrounded by a group, a group of friends who were all in that age category and some of them were beginning to have these experiences in their own lives not so much for themselves as they were the the victims of so their partners were giving them difficult so in that group of friends, as we were you know we used to sort of share confidences and things this this became the sort of theme if you like of my mid 40s <laughs> that mm -hmm. uh, and i was just trying to see you know when as you were asking the question as i remember that milan kundera i think said something which i was trying to look up yeah and this is this also reflects the first question you asked me he says characters are not he says it a lot better than i ever could characters are not born like people of a woman they are born of a situation they are born of a sentence a metaphor contained in a nutshell yeah. mm -hmm. and they are born from a human possibility and i think that was that it comes so the story of adoption came from just a newspaper clipping that i i saw somewhere and that was how that story the, the last of those books came to be written the one about the adopted girl goes back in search of her biological mother so they they just emerge from somewhere and it's never ever with a with an agenda in mind that i write these books that's good yeah. uh, where do uh, your women uh, women characters come from exactly <laughs> it's from, <laughs> from they're not born of other born women <laughs> born from circumstance yeah. and from possibility uh, and from milan kundera also said they're all unrealized possibilities my own unrealized possibilities mm. very beautiful way to put it mm. um but yeah i i could say I'd certainly never find the same a better way to describe where they come from so yeah they come a little bit from me they come a little bit from people i'm surrounded by they come from things i overhear they come from the newspaper sometimes as dull as that i mean the adoption book was um there was a minister here minister mm. for overseas affairs as a woman called claire short and there was a tiny little piece in the newspaper one morning about the son whom she had given up when she was this was in 1950s england where which was not a, a a kindly place to have a child out of wedlock so um she'd had this child and immediately given him up for adoption and 
many, many years later when he was in his 20s and he was a young army officer, I think, uh, army cadet or something, he came in search of her. He found out he was allowed access to his papers and he found his mother was Claire Short. So he came in search of her and there was a picture in the paper of a very happy reunion between this mother and son. Uh, my book doesn't have such a happy sort of uh, reunion between the, the biological mother and her daughter, but that that's how sometimes books kind of develop a you know, narrative which goes off in a direction of its own. But this idea came from there. So that woman is not Claire Short, the woman in that book, the, the character. She's certainly not Claire Short, the minister, the British minister. She's an Indian woman who came to England as a student and ended up having this, this uh, child she had to give up for adoption. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but they, yeah, it's a kind of, in the process of writing, being as long as it is, because you're sitting with your laptop for days and days and days, it sort yeah. of gestates yeah. and becomes something. Mm. different yeah sure well, that's good ma'am uh, in india people consider uh, love and marriage maybe after uh, some time living together after some time they will consider marriage as their fate but you have written a book as love and marriage as accidents do you really think <laughs> they are accidents? <laughs> I think I'm Indian enough to believe in fate to some yeah. extent, to believe that there are things, are, certain things are preordained and there's very little you can do about them. Uh, but I am now, as I said to you earlier, <laughs> convinced enough and mm -hmm. um, strong enough to, to believe that there are many things you can do to you know, improve yourselves or help yourselves out of certain situations. And um, yeah, I, so accidents, that, that was the, the sort of light, uh, rather unkind, actually, I think, comedy that I wrote uh, soon mm -hmm. after Ancient Promises, after, afterwards was also written, but yeah. put away as a manuscript. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this was, it was a title which, it reflected what was in the book, which is mm -hmm. that people just, you know, almost by accident seem to find themselves with each other and you think, oh, how did that happen? So it's, it's <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's kind of fate that I'm talking mm. about rather than by using the word accidents. Accidents, so. Um, it's a you book really... that I, I wouldn't even have reread it since then. So I, <laughs> I, I don't even remember the names of the characters, to be honest. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, you know, um, tell me something about Kerala. My homeland. <laughs> you, you, you left the place after your marriage and uh, after a long time, you came back and lived here for two years. You built a very beautiful house also on the beach. Uh, you, you wanted to go away from this place, but yet it enchants you like anything. It keeps drawing you, you all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even recently you have tweeted you wanted to go back to Kerala because of this COVID-19. You are not able to go there for the literary festival or something like that. So at how do moment, you... Yeah, sorry. Uh, how do you look at Kerala? Very complex question indeed. Are you reserving your worst <laughs> questions for the end? <laughs> I don't have an easy answer to that, <laughs> Professor Rupraj. Um, what can I say? It's in my blood. Kerala is pulsing through my veins with every breath that I take, with everything I do. And um, I, I will, you know, I am a daughter of that soil. And I came such a Keralite, actually, I don't know, because I wasn't brought up there. I didn't, um, I mean, we, my brother and I were taken on our compulsory holidays to Kerala every two years when my parents went down to see their parents. So, and it was in those days in our childhood, I suppose when we were very small, an exciting place to be because, uh, you know, the rivers, the canals, the dragonflies, all these things that, you know, um, children thrive on. We had we had sort of adventurous holidays and we fussed over by the Amumas and so on. But um, as I grew up, I started to feel more and more conflicted about Kerala. I think um, I started to feel that it was, um, you know, I was, I was a sort of object of fun in some ways for my cousins who were 
the, the born and bred in Kerala and, and we used to turn up these city kids and uh, not be able to speak Malayalam that fluently or not really know, not, not being culturally sort of um, in touch. And we were a bit of a joke and it used to be sort of fun for everybody else except us. So I went through that phase as well. And then I had that, my arranged marriage and I actually lived in, in very conservative um, Kerala, which was, you know, which I had only seen in the movies till that point. Mm -hmm. Because my own family was, was by and large, of, you know, the, the Maranadan Malayalis, as you say, the Malayalis who lived outside and we would sort of congregate in Kerala at them during the holidays. But we were a breed apart in some ways to the family, the families that I got to know later, who were more sort of rooted in, in Kerala ways. So that for me, I think, was the time when I became most um, both uh, extricated within the whole Kerala system, got to understand it a lot better than I'd ever understood it before, and yet grew to to loathe some of it. To be perfectly honest, and it's a strong word to use, but there was there were there were times when I used to rail against what I felt was was was. Um, injustices, I would ask, I, I, I hesitate to use the word injustice because that sounds like something to do with the law, but it just confused me every time that a state that prided itself so much on its uh, education and on its literacy and on being, I mean, they are, Keralites are amongst the most informed people in the world, I think, and I'm, I say this yeah. living in a Western country. So in all sincerity, and I mean it as a compliment. And yet alongside that sits this deep-rooted conservatism, and this is conservatism with a small c, which is um, more difficult sometimes to understand and to come to terms with. And you think, where does that come from? I mean, we, we, we talk about being fatalistic, we talk about being superstitious, and we talk about uh, being the, the patriarchy, and we use all these words, and they all fit so easy alongside the education and the literacy they're there in Kerala all the time and you think how do those two coexist how do they pull along together how, you know, it, and this the state has managed like that for you know since its birth I would have thought more the very strong women the matrilineal systems of the Nile all of those things so there's so much going for the modernity of Kerala and yet alongside sits this very, very conservative and very orthodox sort of system as well. So that is something which I'm still puzzled by and still in some ways unable to come to grips with fully. I still love going back and especially love going back now. My mother's in her 80s and living in Trivandrum. So mm -hmm. I go as frequently as I can. And then, yes, I built this house and I, again, I wrote quite a light sort of book about um, that whole thing about the other whole aspect of Kerala, which is the bureaucracy and the politics, which is which opened up another whole can of worms for me. So um, it will keep calling me back, and that's why I have this little place. It's it's not it's very beautifully located on it's literally yards away from the sea, so it's 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 actually probably quite a dangerous spot to be building a house in, but it is um, perfect for. Or just getting away from everything. I mean, our, our neighbors are quite sort of friendly, and, mm -hmm. and I can't I get it. But, but um, it is, yeah. It, uh, that that is that beckons me back. <laughs> Very. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could just get on a plane and go. Actually, right now, but yeah, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. yeah. And. Uh, Coming back to the the last the work in in, in progress, you know, you have a, a nonfiction on the cards. Uh, can you say something about the book, ma'am? It, it that is the book that I mentioned, the one about Kerala. It's called A House for Mister Misra. Mister Misra, about, yeah, yes. Yeah, that's it's it's sort of uh, about the whole process by which this house came to be. It's actually mm -hmm. I just call it a house is a, is a vast exaggeration because it's really just a like a large studio. It's mm. like one, one largish room and it one yeah. corner is a kitchenette and the other corner is the bathroom and it's, it's a sort of just meant, it's a writer's studio really. That's mm. all that we had permission for and it was all very complicated as I said, the bureaucracy and everything was sort of going against us. Something called the Coastal Regulation Zone which occupies about three chapters in the book because it's such a complicated <laughs> okay, piece okay. of 
that we have to work our way around. So um, it, that's not in progress. That's actually completed. It's completed. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's being sold on Amazon or something. So okay. it's available. And again, I tried not to, uh, it was my way of dealing with Kerala in, a, in the, the only way I think I can deal with it, with its various complexities and paradoxes, which is with humor and with a smile rather than getting annoyed with it and railing against it. <laughs> that gets me nowhere. Uh, apart from being an author, uh, you do a lot of uh, philanthropic activities. Uh, you are, uh, you consider yourself uh, on Twitter, you consider yourself as a special needs mom. And you help uh, this uh, Wahani Scholar Network uh, a lot. Uh, yesterday also you had a session scholars yes we had our graduation ceremony yesterday yeah, yeah it's very happy to see that ma'am and uh, what is this Wahani scholar network and how do you help uh, children with special needs so the the special needs actually there was I think in the introduction there was a bit of a glitch because Wahani is not a, a, a educational project for people with special needs that was something I did in Delhi so as, as some of the some of the people here who read Ancient Promises will know that I am myself a parent of a young woman, oh, yes. a woman especially. So that is where my my uh, interest came from originally, and then I did a course in the University of London in special education needs, and then I went off to Delhi and worked alongside uh, a few other parents. So it was not something I was ever going to be able to do on my own. So it was mostly led by um, a couple of the other parents, in particular, somebody called Shanti Aulak. She has an organization called Muskan, which is like a, like a school or a vocational center for people with disabilities. So we set up a residential unit for adults with learning disabilities. So once they finished with school and once the parents perhaps have you know have grown old, it's a place for them to to live, to remain safe, to remain busy, to have a, you know a life, and a and a peer group. So that's up and running, and that is there in uh, it's in a place called uh, Dera in um, on the outskirts of Delhi. Uh, the government actually provided us with three acres of land, and so it was it was a it's a reasonably successful project, but. Um, the thing which we found quite difficult to achieve was, you know, excellence in terms of standards and the way it was run. It was just being one of the first of its kind in Delhi. We had to kind of go along with compromising along the way. So it, there is a huge waiting list, and there are people still very keen to get in. But I think I think it can be improved. But that's that's there and it's running along reasonably well, thanks to the parents. Who I worked with, who are still living in Delhi. I've had to cut myself off because I'm now back in London. Vahani is easier to do on, online and as a distance thing because it is a scholarship foundation that's been set up by friends, uh, which which uh, educates, which takes children who are very bright. So it's the other end of the spectrum, as far as I'm concerned, from my special needs work. The children who are very bright and very very uh, come from extenuating circumstances and. Most of them come from, some of them have, you know, have no parents at all. Uh, those who do have parents are very low earning families. They're, you know, uh, sharecroppers, not even, you know, people who, who don't even own any of the land they farm on and so on. So um, th mostly through the JNV uh, schools, I think you're probably aware of those, the schools that have been, the Navodhya Vidyalayas that have been set up in rural areas. We recruit bright children, so the, the, the cream of that lot, and then help them through their college years. So we pay for the college education. We help them with the residential requirements, whether that's in hostels or paying guest accommodation or something. And much more than that, it's a mentorship scheme. So they, we remain closely involved with these students until and beyond their graduation. So yesterday was graduation day and that, Last evening, I had about right. seven or eight of them were texting me saying, I hope you stay in touch, ma. I'm not going to go off and you know live my life without you. So there's an expectation that we'll carry on being a part of a network, of a family. And we call ourselves the Mahani family, actually, because, we, because you're saying things like educational foundation and all that sounds a bit too... Uh, sort of grand <laughs> so we're about the, the scholars now we have about 88 because it's been going for about four years so there's 88 89 scholars a new batch is just starting in the face of this terrible pandemic poor things they've 
enough confusion. Sorry, there's a police car or something going outside. Um, so the, even everything got delayed, you know, the, the IIT entrance exams, the, the NEET medical entrance exams and everything has got delayed. So the, this particular batch are really up against it. You know, it's very hard for them to know. They, they see this open road ahead, which is littered with, with all kinds of obstacles at the moment. It really is a terrible time for anyone who's young, I would say. Mm, sure, sure. And uh, by the way, how do you sp spend your COVID-19 days? A lot of it is actually because of, thanks to Zoom, thanks to this excellent uh, technology <laughs> that we now have. And I know it's Chinese and I shouldn't be saying anything nice about the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is we've been, it's enabled so much communication and staying in touch with large groups of people. I find it absolutely fascinating and absolutely Wonderful, and I wonder how did we manage before this? So our Vahani work is almost all now like this. So we stay together as a group, we bond through this uh, technology. We do a lot of, we have things like English uh, tuition. So we, because a lot of these children come with very poor English uh, language skills. So we teaching them, we have a number of tutors, we have a different group of mentors. So uh, all of that is being done mostly by distance because there are very few, uh, mentors and mentees who happen to be in the same city. That's very unusual. I mean, Delhi is one place where there are possibly a few, but otherwise we're all scattered all over the world and just staying in touch would have been so difficult. So via, you know, Zoom and WhatsApp and all of that, we stay in touch with the yeah. scholars and it's been a particularly difficult time, mm -hmm. you know, very important yeah. to sort of stay in touch with them. So much of the COVID the pandemic lockdown time has been spent just keeping the spirits up. We've had webinars with them. We've had mm -hmm. debates and uh, quizzes and all kinds of different activities. Every week we try to do something just to keep everybody's spirits up and keep everyone together. Mm -hmm. Most of them had to go home and hostels and colleges closed. And so they all went mm -hmm. back to their houses where it's quite difficult for them because their, their houses are not exactly geared towards helping with the, um, you know, with their scholarly activities is quite tough for them. Mm. So, um, yeah, and I must admit that my writing has taken a, so if anyone here is waiting for a work in progress, there isn't very much to report because while lockdown should have given me ample mm. time to sit down and write, I think mm. it's sort of on the back burner a little bit oh, well. because I think other people need me a bit more. And for me to just sit with my own little writing project would seem like a very selfish thing to do at this point in time. You recently you prescribed some books for the readers in the Hindu. Uh, you do have you been know? following me on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, so you saw uh, my... do, you, do you prescribe any books for our students? I should ask, or... I should ask you as a professor, do you approve of my reading been, list? Yeah. <laughs> I already, I already yes, shared your reading list with my students, ma'am. Uh, oh. uh, do you prescribe any books for my students? What uh, specifically, I mean, what age are we talking about and what uh, interests? They are all postgraduate students of English. I don't know whether, I mean, you see, I, I'm a little conscious of the fact that um, some of my, you know, the way I was, when I learned, did my English literature course. It was very Eurocentric. Uh, does it remain quite Eurocentric? And, uh, you know, like for instance, the Odyssey and the Iliad. I had to study um, the Odyssey when I was in uh, my first year BA actually in, in uh, Delhi. Um, so because I read the Odyssey as a 19, 18 year old, mm -hmm. uh, the character was somewhere, you know, I was kind of familiar with them. So that's why the first book on my lockdown reading list is that one called The Silence of yeah. the Girls, yes. which is the story of the Iliad, but told from the point of view of the women. Mm. And it was stunning. I thought I, it just, it, it appealed to me on so many levels. For one, I'm familiar with that whole, you know, with Homer's works. So that was why I recommended that. It just, it reached out to me in ways that are difficult to define. And, you know, the, like I said, this whole uh, Me Too movement was happening around the time it just sort of tailed off a little bit when I picked up this book and started reading it. And to hear these women's voices from, I don't know, you know, whenever the Trojan War took place, 
BC, BC, you know, to hear this, the same kind of the anguish and the pain of these women who were completely neglected by Homer when he wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad. Mm. Um, that was a very powerful, very powerful reading experience, I thought. Some of the other books that I have in that list are, um, I, I wanted to, because it was for the Hindu, I wanted to mm. make an effort to include some of the Indian writers, obviously. Mm. And I have been a bit cut off, so I haven't been able to get my hands on this one, which everybody's talking about, The Burning, which is supposed to be a, a reflection of present-day India and the, the sort of nationalism and the so this Megha Majumdar who also lives in the US I think has written this book about a character who gets accused of a terrorist bomb plot um, even though I think she might be innocent so that is something which I haven't yet managed to read but I I wanted to, a to say that I'm going to read it and b to say um, that these are there are lots of young Indian authors still coming up who read and encouraged so would your students by and large be interested in um, sort of Indian writing in English or yeah. is it a much wider view? Uh, they, they are very much interested in Indian writing in English. And, and the reason for that is that they, there's more to identify with, isn't it? Mm. There's more to sort of, yeah, to appeal directly. Mm. Um, so yes, I would say, I mean, uh, the one, the other one, which again, I haven't been able to read so far was the one by Tishani Doshi. And she happens to be a friend as well. So I need to get my hands on. But um, that also I haven't been able to read. Small Days and Nights, I think it's called. But otherwise, yeah, I, I, I try to read. You mentioned the previous speakers you've had in your... Uh, in the college, you yeah. mentioned Shashi Pande, you mentioned Anita Nai. These are all people I, I, uh, I know. I, you know, I, I <laughs> been with. We have a little uh, writers group, and Shashi is very much steers that group. So I have a lot of respect and time for her for her writings. She's been doing feminist writing for a very long time, and very quietly, she mm. quietly gets on with the task of telling women's stories and. And, and sometimes I feel her writing is too quiet, which is why, you know, it doesn't get talked about as much as, as, as they deserve. Um, but yes, I think we come back to these. And of the new breed of writers, the, the, the younger ones, there's these new names that are emerging now that I personally haven't been able to read, but they sound like very exciting young voices. Yeah. Uh, being a grand niece of uh, Takali Sivasangarapalli, do you have any plans to write a novel in Malayalam? <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish I could. This was what I thought I would do once my house on the beach was built in, in Trivandrum. I thought I would uh, enroll a local tutor and sit there and teach myself, get myself to learn Malayalam to a level where I could actually start reading and writing. Mm -hmm. And I've had this conversation with Anita Nair actually because she's very fluent. She grew up, mm -hmm. I think, in Kerala. In, and so she can read and write Malayalam very well. And I am so envious of her ability to do that. She also doesn't write her books. I don't think any of her writing is in Malayalam. It's not, mm -hmm. not even lighter yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. writing. But um, uh, I can't even, even at that stage to, to read somebody else's book in Malayalam mm -hmm. is a challenge. I think some people have got unmuted. Yeah, uh, yes, please, please unmute uh, participants. Please unmute you, yourself. Uh, is that of disturbance? Yeah, yes, ma'am, please. Unmute. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, I, did I, I lost my thread of thought. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you have any plans to, to make your novels into uh, movies? Already you have given rights of your first oh, novel. Yeah. I um, I have had film rights sort of sought after by, I think, for about four of my books. Um, I've actually lost track of this because while it's very nice, it's very exciting when, a, when someone comes and buys the film rights. Um, I've learned, I think after number four, I learned that it's all very well. You get a little bit of money and the, you can sign a contract and it's quite exciting at that point in time. But then you need to forget about it because film deals seem to take so long. 
and they're so cumbersome and they're so um what is the word this you know there's, there's so many different elements to it so many different people involved so many different pots of money that come into it that by and large they don't happen mm-hmm. the film doesn't actually get made so the one which i got most excited about rani actually when sushmita sen bought the rights she was at that point in time quite keen to play the role of rani lakshmi bai herself but as the years have passed i think that's going to get rather difficult because rani lakshmi bai died when she was barely 29 so sushmita i think is would find it hard to um, to get into that yeah to into that role but um it it was you know the, the unfortunate thing where i feel very sorry is when someone actually buys the film rights off me and mm-hmm. then can't raise the funds from i think there was a television series that went out around that time and so the producers whom sushmita had lined up backed out so then she didn't um, you know that the film never got made and i think now it's it falls out you know you have something called an option period and i think we're now out of that period so it's it's available once again so mm-hmm. i can keep saying oh it's nice to sell film rights because again it's a little bit of money in the kitty which is very nice for a mm-hmm. for a writer especially but um yeah the actual idea of seeing something on film i mean more recently i've submitted one to the bbc uh, and that's one of the secrets books which i felt had more potential for a bbc adaptation because it's actually set in this country in in the uk so that secrets and sins the middle one uh but yeah but what happens to these things basically you have to submit and then just let it go because you know how it's going to sort of develop is such a such a sort of unlikely tale that it's best not to kind of pin any hopes on it but if if one of these became i'd love to be involved in the scripting because not that i want to retain control because i i believe very much that once you once a writer and author has written a book and sent it to the publishers you just have to let go it 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 means different things after that to different people editors respond to it differently mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. readers readers keep bringing their own sort of um their own ideas their own preconceived sort of notions about life and all of that to books you write so someone might read ancient promises and tell me it's a love story it's about first love isn't it someone else will read it and say it's about mothers and daughters i could see that from the start it was about three four generations of mothers and daughters mm-hmm. a third person will read that same book and say it's about special needs children isn't mm-hmm. it because there's yeah. a child in it especially yeah. so it just it just reaches in different ways to different people and to try and control all of that is an impossible task so you just have to let it go somewhere and a filmmaker will bring their own skills to it but i would like i'd like to be involved because i've never written a script so i just like the idea of of um, of being involved in a new kind of writing skill that would be interesting to do how do you consider jayshree mishra as a, a journalist you've been into broadcast journalism for some time yes i was a journalist for a for for a short period <laughs> because because you know when i trained over here and then what happens is when you're a rookie journalist you get given the the worst what they call the graveyard shift which means that you have to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and get on a the public transport at 5 o'clock and reach your recording desk and be sitting there at the news desk before 6 o'clock in the morning and um then you do your 8 hour shift and then reach home just dead to the world so i was struggling not so much with the hours i think i would have coped with the hours as you know I, and I, it was interesting work i'll give it that but my daughter was living at home at the time and i physically couldn't cope with the the demands on my time because the timings were so awful so that career got chucked out to the window a long time ago and very sadly soon after i'd qualified and got a nice job with the bbc and all that but um it was in that period so there's always and let's let's hope that is this is the case with this pandemic as well that however awful an event might seem at the time there's there's inevitably some kind of glimmer of light that that shows up somewhere in the distance which becomes bigger and bigger and in my case it was the writing of ancient promises i i actually given up my bbc job i found myself stuck at home i was deeply unhappy with um, the state of my life everybody my husband would go off to work my daughter would go off to school and i would be stuck there all by myself 
in the house thinking I couldn't even hold the job that I was given, a nice job with the BBC, and I couldn't hold it down because of the, the state of my life. So while it was very easy to feel sorry for myself and let myself sink into that awful thing, which, you know, of, of, of feeling just being depressed, um, what I did, I think, quite fortuitously, I, and I'm, I'm so glad I did it, was start to work. My husband, we had a new computer at the time, and I was just learning to use it, learning to use its functions. And so I wrote a body of, I, it was supposed, going to be just two or three pages of text, which I could then use to learn the functions of Word. But um, that starting to write, well, what should I write about? And I thought, let me just write one of my memories of something. It was an unhappy memory. And I thought, let me start writing that and see if I can have two pages to, to work with. And I was bashing away writing and this took me back from sitting in a small study in a South London house. My mind was cast back to Kerala, which, whose complexities we've just talked about. <laughs> and I found myself there. I found myself back, but you know, 10 or 15 years had suddenly swept away and I was in that place and in that time and reliving some of the experiences I've had. And yeah. that was what became Promise. Please mute yourself. Someone's unmuted again. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, ma'am. And now we have uh, a few questions from the participants. Uh, can okay, you go okay. for that? I request uh, Professor Abhinaya to read the questions over to Abhinaya. Am I audible? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, I've been here, you can continue. I've been here reading the questions. Sabina's screen has got frozen. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, yes. I'll ask Professor Charanya to continue. Charanya, please. We'll read the, uh, the first question. Uh, uh, Ma'am, the question is, how did you feel when your debut novel was published. So this is from Ms. R. Karpagam. It was an absolutely amazing experience, as you can imagine. The thing is, it didn't happen overnight. Um, the process began as it, as it would for most writers. It began with me trying to find an agent. So the most exciting moment in the whole process was when uh, I finished writing in the manuscript and I sent it off to in those days everything was done by post so I sent it off to a few agents I had one or two rejections and then this luckily for me I, you know I really didn't know how to even search for an agent but the, one of the top agents who's David Godwin who I think the name is quite well known in India because of his success with uh, God of Small Things as well so David Godwin picked up the phone and actually rang me up I must have written my number on the manuscript. And to receive that phone call was, I think, one of the most exciting moments of my life. So David Godwin rang up and said, but we like it. We like what you've written. And do you think you could send us the rest of it? Is it ready or are you, because I only send three chapters when you first write to an agent. And I said, oh, it's ready. There's a whole book over here on my computer, which he was quite pleased about. So he said, well, send us the rest. We'll have a read of it and get back to you. So it was actually quite a, just an exploratory phone call that he made. But that for me was, I think, the, the most exciting thing. After that, once there is an agent in the picture, you know, he and his wife actually helped. They kind of re, we did a redraft and rewrite and all that. And then it was sent off to publishers. Um, that, it was nerve wracking at that point. And the reason why it was less exciting as we went along 
was that I started to feel very worried and very anxious and very guilty about the fact that other people were also depending on me. So by then, David Godwin, I was invested in it. David Godwin's wife, Heather, who had helped me, was invested in it. So I started to get a bit worried. So it was more like anxiety rather than excitement when they sent it off to publishers. I just thought, I just want somebody to say yes to this. To this. So when Penguin, actually, it was Penguin were the first people to come back with what they call a preemptive offer. So they came up with an offer. Of course, it was very exciting. And um, David and everybody was terribly excited. But for me, the relief was more that I hadn't let David <laughs> and Heather down. So it was more like relief at that point in time. Very exciting. And then as soon as we said yes to Penguin, there was a huge bouquet of flowers that came from the editor, who was a very charming woman called Louise Moore. So she sent me this um, lovely bouquet of flowers. So yeah, that was a lovely day as well. <laughs> well next, uh, uh, Professor Sagi Menonadan of our department has a question for you. Over to Sagi. Sagi, could you please ask your question? Uh, ma'am, good evening, ma'am. Do you good hear evening. me? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, just, uh, just I need to comment on the questions which I've been uh, asked myself. Like, uh, I just read the questions that I wrote. How do Indian writers balance the pressure between the linguistic market governed or dictated by the economic capitalistic norms and the need to reflect the near authentic version of India? Have you got my question, ma'am? I, I, I sort of have. There's two or three different elements to it. So I'm just trying to figure out. Um, I don't know whether this, the television adaptation, we just started here last night on BBC, a suitable boy, Vikram Tate suitable boy. Is that in India or uh, on Netflix or something? I don't know whether that's available. But that, I think, answers some of the questions that you've just put in this very intelligent question of yours, is it's the first time ever that there, there is a, an, a BBC series. It's a very short series, only six one hour long episodes. But it is the first time ever that an Indian writer has a uh, writer's book is being adapted for British TV, um, which is completely peopled by Indian characters, directed by an Indian person, which is Meera Nair. Um, and the only sort of white person in all of that whole, the whole project is the, the person who scripted it because uh, Vikram Seth specifically asked for a person called Andrew Davis, who's quite well known in the UK, to write the script of this. He's the person who wrote the script for Pride and Prejudice when it came on TV. So Vikram must have thought that he's a, a seasoned hand at this kind of period drama. But watching it last night, and uh, tapping into the authenticity, which I think was a part of your question, the, la the last part of your question was about remaining authentic to, to sort of, to Indian characters and Indian settings. Now that sprang off the screen at me. I mean, I, you know, being Indian, and my, my husband is actually from Lucknow, which is where much of this has, has been shot, I believe. And the authenticity was remarkable. And I kept thinking because the characters, although they're English speaking characters, like many of us are, even when we are in India, we're speaking in English. Um, they slip into Hindi just at the moment when you know a normal person would slip into Hindi. Or then they have an Urdu sort of person, an Urdu speaking character who will say some, some shire in Urdu. So all of this, these elements, which are fine for me. You know, I am a Indian, there's, I am South Indian, but I'm married to a North Indian. So I could sort of tap into all these little elements quite easily. But I was thinking, how is the average British audience going to take this? I mean, it's going to work. How can you be authentic and yet reach out, as you said, to commercial interests? And after all, it is all about being, you know, commercially viable as well. The BBC has to show that it's got the audience. So um, I had a quick look on Twitter. There was no other way to immediately assess how people. So I looked at the hashtag, a suitable boy. And I saw that there were it seemed to be as many people saying, I don't know what's going on and why is the BBC doing this to us? As there were people saying, this is brilliant. This is so real. This is the India that I'm familiar with. And it wasn't only Indian names saying that. There were British uh, audiences as well. So 
it is it is a struggle and if you're an indian writer and you're sitting in the west and you're writing to let's say a predominantly western readership or your agent is a western man or woman or your editor is a white woman i mean how do you balance just being true to your story and your characters your characters are indian your story is set in india do you have to to, to remain authentic and yet convince these people that yeah sure don't worry there is a market for this here we can get this through it's tough it's tough it's, it's not it's not the easiest thing to do and it's it's a very good question you asked because i think it is currently a hot topic over here you know there's this whole thing about back to black lives matter and the fact that a lot of indian writers felt they were being pushed out of the scene because editors were saying things like oh we had an indian book last year we don't really want to do another indian book now i mean they wouldn't say that for any white person's book would they they wouldn't say there was a white person's book last year so let's not have any white people this year so this whole thing about black lives matter is asking some of the questions that i think you just put to me i hope i didn't misunderstand your question but amazing response ma'am thank you so much good thank you uh, uh, for the next question over to abin aya yeah. abin aya are you there am i audible now yes ah, yes, yes please. sir Uh, so this is a question from a research scholar rose maria reji she has two questions ma'am the first one is how do you choose female characters for your historical novels is it your personal fascination with certain women from history or their stories or their representations for example in rani you have a very popular historical character while in a love story for my sister you have margaret who is not known to many the second part of the question is this what are the challenges that you face as a writer when you venture into historical fiction particularly when you deal with very popular characters as in rani do you have to think about the sentiments of the society very good questions again but <laughs> well, the easier one is the first question which is where these characters came from and lakshmi bai was um because i was just looking very consciously for a i wanted to turn my hand to historical fiction and um i i wanted the character to be an indian female character i was quite sure about that um but beyond that i had no specific idea so i started to look and obviously rani lakshmi bai is one of the first people you would think of if you're looking for a strong female indian character from history um and i wanted from the british indian that period because i i live in britain i thought it made sense but um i didn't want rani lakshmi bai at first because she was such an obvious choice so i put her aside and then i looked around and i looked at the begums of bhopal and i looked at hazrat mahal and i tried so many others but there was something about lakshmi bai that kept coming back now this is where we spoke earlier professor rubaraj and i about superstition and you know all of those other things that fate as we said um i don't know whether it was fate what it was but rani lakshmi bai just kept popping up again and again i couldn't put her down so it was almost as if at some point i didn't have a choice and it had to be rani lakshmi bai story and the more i read up on her the more fascinated i found i was getting because there were more facets to her than i knew that i ever knew existed and margaret's story came because well while i was researching rani lakshmi bai actually uh margaret story emerged and i was so fascinated by her at one point she's the daughter of general wheeler who was commanding the british forces in uh, kanpur at the time of the 1857 uprising and she was only 18 at the time kanpur went you know was engulfed with this with the uprising and went up in flames and there are also stories about the women the british women who were all taken to the bb gar and killed and the drop thrown into a well this was the really sad story on the british side that emerged um when i was doing the research and margaret was one of the two young women who was kidnapped from the banks of the river where uh, there was a terrible massacre of of the of the british party and these two young girls were kidnapped and taken off on horseback by the the sipahis the 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 the, the uh, they were the soldiers who were fighting on the other side the rebels so um one of them amelia horn actually came back she when when the british won the the the, up, the war and you know they were they sort of she did a deal with her captor basically and came back and these are real characters 
she said she'd seen Margaret being taken and Margaret never returned. So search parties were sent for her. There were sightings reported. It was a fascinating story of a girl who seemed to deliberately choose to carry on living with her Indian husband. Because I think somewhere along the way, she would have married the man who kidnapped her. And she seemed to make a deliberate choice. She could have gone away. The British were looking for her, but she stayed. So that story fascinated me so much. I thought, what would have what would have motivated her to do that? Why would she have gone? And I, I nearly at one point nearly put Lakshmi Bai's story aside to chase up the story of Margaret. But I was by then too far invested in Lakshmi Bai. So I carried on finishing and finished that book. But I knew Margaret had to emerge in another book somewhere. And I didn't want to write a straightforward historical fiction book again. So I made it a sort of part contemporary and part historical narrative in a love story for my sister. And it's about abducted girls rather than about 1857 specifically. And um, the second part of the question was about uh, historical fiction and the difficulties that you might face. And that is also a very good question because we touched upon it while Professor Uraj and I were talking. But um, there is, when you take up, especially if you choose a sort of iconic character from history and decide to view them warts and all, and that's what I wanted to do with Lakshmi Bai. I wanted to see her as a mother and a wife and a daughter and a lover and a, a queen and a friend. It's all these different aspects of just being a woman, being a human being. I didn't want her to be just this figure whom you see on a horse, you know, which, you, which is evident in statues all across North India. So I wanted this sort of multidimensional character, which we all are. And... Um, in that depiction, I caused a lot of offense. I caused, you know, upset. I don't know whether it was genuine offense or political offense, because I think looking back that it was a sort of political opportunism for some people to start objecting to the book and saying it's been written by a British author. Suddenly I became British to these people who just wanted a bit of a fuss. They wanted to make, they banned the book in UP. There was a big kerfuffle in the UP assembly. And um, Mayavati was the chief minister at the time. She just said, well, ban the book. Then the book got banned in UP. But it wasn't one of those bans which got policed or, you know, which people then took too seriously. So it was still selling and selling reasonably well, I believe, in, in that region because the book is set in that region. So um, it can cause difficulties. And I would, I would say, if any of you are planning to write a similar book, if you're writing about a real character who existed and who was held very dear to whatever groups of, you know, let's say political groups. Um, I would say step into that with care. It is, it's a battle which is, seems to have become a lot worse in recent times. And yes, I'm not sure I would wish that sort of trauma on anyone. It's, it, it's, it was, it's getting tougher and tougher to write what you just want to write. Thank you, ma'am. So the next question is from Giftlin I Hello, ma'am. Uh, so I'll read out the question for you. What is your advice for developing a healthy man-women relationship, ma'am? This is me as a psychologist or me as a writer? <laughs> <laughs> me as a marriage counselor. <laughs> healthy man-woman relationship in my view, has to be a relationship between equals. Very easy to say, very difficult to achieve. And you alone sitting there saying, I'm going to be equal with my partner isn't enough. You have to find a partner who also thinks <laughs> it's a good idea that you should be equals. Otherwise, you just end up squabbling and fighting all the time. So what's the point? Um, but mutual respect and mutual kindness, I think, I mean, I, we had a, a young friend came over the other day. She's someone who's very involved with the Vahani scholarship, which I mentioned. And um, she's a whole lot younger than we are, but she's, she takes time out for us because, um, you know, we help with the foundation and all of that. And she's only about 26 or 27. And she's, um, she had a boyfriend and now she doesn't have a boyfriend. And she's, she's constantly sort of... Uh, what is the word? Torn with the idea that she has to somewhere along the way find a life partner. She's not even sure she wants to find a life partner. She seems to think it might be just too much effort, too much trouble. 
But she, when she came here, we had been about four months into lockdown. And my husband and I were both at home. And so she sat and had lunch with us. And um, she said, she asked me later in the kitchen, how do you do it? How can you bear to live with somebody for four months? She said, four months you've been living under the same roof in the same house. How did you do it? And I thought to myself, it's a lot more than four months. It's like it's been about 30 years now. <laughs> so she, if for her to look ahead, she's got, let's say, more than 30 years to go if she wants to find a partner she wants to stay with for the rest of her life. So I think it is about realizing that... Um, life with somebody else in close proximity with someone else will only work out if you're willing to make those compromises and be uh, kind to each other, be nice to each other um, and respect each other. So that's me with my marriage counselor's cap on. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Who's asking? Hello. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Is that who's asking the question? Uh, Mindalika from Kerala. Your line Hello, is a little wobbly. So yeah, let's see. Just ask your question. Let me see if I can hear you. Uh, Ma'am, uh, the thing that I, I have two questions mainly. Uh, old silence of the girls uh, based on Iliad's Homer. Homer's Iliad, sorry. And uh, what's your opinion about uh, Aristophanes lies a traitor? I haven't read Aristophanes, is Hello? it? Hello. Yeah, yeah, your voice Aristophanes. is up very badly. I heard uh, the first bit, I think. The first bit was Aristophanes lies a Hello? Yeah. Did you get me, ma'am? I don't know whether other people can hear, but yeah. I don't think I'm getting no. You'll have to write down your question, I'm afraid. Yes. Miss yeah. Indulekar, we are not able to hear you properly. Please put your questions in the chat box. We will get it to the author. Uh, shall we go to the next question, ma'am? Bandwidth issues, no? Yeah, I think so. Um, so this question is from Dr. R. Vidya. Uh, the question is, do you think this general, general literary or patriarchal curiosity to unravel the mystery, supposedly shrouding the female psyche, has decreased down the years, or does it still remain an enthralling area to probe into? Is, if the question is aimed at me, I would say continues to remain a very enthralling <laughs> issue to probe into. But I don't know if, if it's a more general question, it's been a concern of mine that very not enough male authors are interested enough in the female psyche. Again, I'm, I'm assuming that's what the question was about. So, um, you know, the, to, to have a female-led narrative uh, written by a man, I think, continues to be a bit of a rare thing. So, uh, yes, I, I don't think that it's a universal case at all. But by and large, I think women writers are keen on exploring the female psyche, that it just is. And having mentioned Vikram Seth earlier, he's one of the rare characters who is willing to probe the female psyche. This, a Suitable Boy was all about um, young Lata Mehra, who was at 19, looking to search for, the, for a suitable boy to spend the rest of her life with. And it is based on his own mother. So it's about a young woman who's about 19 or 20 in newly independent India. And I don't know whether there's any, whether any of this audience will know about his mother, who is Justice Leela Seth. Absolutely lovely woman, really, really beautiful person. And uh, it is apparently telling her story from, you know, I don't know how much of the detail is her, you know, emerged from her life. But whether that was the only reason why Vikram wrote it or whether he actually is interested enough in the female psyche, as I said, not enough male writers are. That I don't know. He's, he's not difficult to get hold of to ask these questions. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. The next question, I think Professor Imi will proceed. What, Emmanuel? No, you are, you, you are not audible, Imi. Yes, uh, 
um, um uh, this is from uh, uh, anonymous person why all the hype about marriage in indian fiction is it the expectation of the west or or the writers unable to evolve out of this idea why is every writing uh, is based upon marriages that's the that's the question ma'am i think i'll have to take issue with the question <laughs> i i think it is i think marriage and love and those sort of topics marriage is specific in this question i realize they remain sort of universal themes but when a woman writes a story based you know with one of those with the theme of marriage she gets accused immediately of staying within the narrow domestic sphere and well, you know men have written on this subject for aims and 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 you know they get away with it they're not accused of being of being too domestic in their view so um uh, the Ma martin name is something you get my mind is full of the british authors at the moment philip roth the american author i mean these are the huge big figures literary figures of american and british fiction and they have time and again plumbed this issue of marriage to write their books and in fact their own marriages so you know time and time again you get stories that have emerged from their own lives and their own relationships and um some of them openly autobiographical stories as well and yet they're seen as the big american author or the big uk author they're not seen as being um, they're not accused in the same way that women get accused of staying within a very narrow domestic sphere the two inches of ivory that jane austen talked about i mean jane austen was doing it in her time writing all her books about finding partners and you know getting married and uh, the, the the heartache of parents who can't get their girls married off so it's not even an indian western thing it's it's a sort of preoccupation across the the board i think but it's easy to throw the accusation at women writers and i think doubly easy to throw that accusation at women indian women authors it is just a continuously fascinating subject period oh tabinaya okay the next question is from r karpagam why do you call your poem as snippets i think we have a very young <laughs> <laughs> so the question is this ma'am why do you call your poems as snippets my poems uh, that's a question yeah i haven't really written much poetry i'm not one for poetry i i sometimes get asked to contribute this that and i have to tell people or sometimes someone sends me a book of their own poetry and i feel bad because i don't feel equipped to judge poetry i know i was a student of literature and i have studied poetry you know in my time and i there are some favorite poems that i have um obviously i mean you sometimes wonder does anyone not like poetry to that extent at least but i don't feel um i think the difficulty i might have is with the brevity i think with with the poem you have to carve and carve and carve something down to its barest minimum and i've always struggled with that skill i've never really that's why i write novels and not poetry so the there was one i don't know if you're referring to a, a very tiny book of uh, it was what was that? i've even forgotten what it's called which is more like a gift book with tiny little lines and poems uh, some of my own and some co- quotes from other people and this was just something that penguin was doing penguin was doing a series um of you know little books like gift books you'd find them in gift shops rather than in bookshops and tiny very beautifully produced and i think i did a series on love and they they asked me to um they tempted me by saying that dalai lama is doing the little book of peace so we want you to do the little book of romance that was it so when i thought i'm going to be with the dalai lama and we're going to do a book tour together and he'll talk about peace and i'll talk about romance wouldn't that be lovely <laughs> so i sort of got talked into it but unfortunately i never got to meet the dalai lama and do my book tour with him so but that's the only book of sort of poetry that i've done it's not my genre at all sorry 
the next so the next question, question is from yeah. Indu Leka from Kerala. Uh, what is your opinion on Aristophanes' Lysistrata in contrast with the Silence of Girls of pa Pat Baker? Pat Baker, yeah. Baker. 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 I have never read it's Aristophanes, isn't it? That's how they would pronounce it here. I have not read Aristophanes. And I knew I was telling my husband that I'm going to be up against, I don't know, 100 of academics. And I said, I'm really dreading this sort of academic type of question. Here you are. Here's an academic type of question. <laughs> Fair and for you, ma'am. Aristophanes with Sophocles. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's very much something that has to be left to the academic brains over here. Sure. Sure. Not like me. <laughs> Hello. 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 Yes, yes, I can hear. Is that um, the the name lighting up is Indu Lekha. Same person who asked the question earlier. No? Hello. Hello. Yeah. 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 Yes. Just say the one more question. Yeah. Hello. Indulega, you please uh, write the question in the chat box. So I have it. put in the question. I have put I in the be, question. We'll be taking it up. And we'll that was a little up. bit earlier. Yeah, because when you speak, a lot of disturbances are there. So we'll take it to the oh, author. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. okay. Ask the uh, next question. Yes, uh, the next question is from Rose Maria. Uh, do you find yourself balancing and negotiating between two versions of history in your historical novels, uh, this, the British and Indian perception of same incidents in history? Oh, excellent. Yes. Um, constantly. <laughs> constantly, because history, as we all know, is written by the victor. And... Um, so you have the sort of the British version was the one which prevailed after 1857 happened uh, because the British won in that conflict. You only had their reports of what happened. And even though I tried to research in both places, I tried to do some of my research in the UK and I did some of my research in India, I still kept coming across the British sources all the time. I mean, over here in the British Library, there's, uh, if you go inside, you have to, if you want to search for something, you have to do a very specific search because they, the, the person explained the reason why it has to be a very specific search is they've got what he described as 17 miles of filing cabinets. He said miles and miles and miles of files being kept in a sort of roller system. And he said, if we search for some particular file, it sends a sort of, it's like a microfiche thing they've got. It sends a message across and it sends, it starts moving. The filing system starts moving until those 17 miles of the, and then it comes, it drops down into a box. So that's the amount of material that the British have on that one subject of 1857. Can you imagine that? So the amount of material that was available was, was obviously overwhelming. There was no way I was going to be able to even begin to look at all of that. And on the Indian side, it is much less. So even if you go to the National Archives in Delhi, you find yourself getting the same old, the sort of British sources, either there are copies over there or some bits that are there and not here and so on. And the reason for that is that apparently Rani Lashivai, just to come back more specifically to her story, she had a writing cabinet. This has been mentioned by people, by other people who were close to her. So she had a small writing bureau which traveled with her apparently wherever she went, when, even when, the, when she was going to Kalpi or to Bolia to fight the wars that she fought, this little writing cabinet went with her, which had all her writing material in it. And after the battle of the final battle at Kota Kisarai, which where she lost her life, um, that writing bureau disappeared, just it, it went. So some people said that those who were loyal to her had spirited it away and taken it away somewhere safe. But chances are, because there were such brutal reprisals that the British brought about after 1857, they were so keen to make sure that such a thing never happened again, that the, the reprisals were, you know, the, the, the streets of Kanpur were, were like rivers of blood without exaggeration. So that, that was, um, in, in that kind of a climate, you can imagine that nobody would have been want, would have wanted to be caught with this 
material. This, this would have been incendiary material if, you, if anyone had been caught with it on their person. So no one wanted to be seen to have sided with the rebels. And so I suspect that it just got destroyed. So whatever letters, whatever information was in that would have just gone. Because Lakshmi Bai's son went into hiding with, I think, some of her um, the servants, the helpers. They, kind of, they spirited him away. And they ended up in Indore. And many, many years later, when the British were feeling much more secure about their place, and they had India had passed into the crown, and Queen Victoria was declared the Empress of India and all that, slowly people started emerging from their hiding places. And amongst them was Rani Lakshmi Bai's adopted son over whom the whole battle actually took place. And he came out of hiding and um, asked for a small pension or for some kind of mercy to be shown. Um, I, and I think what they, they, what they did was they didn't give him any money or anything like that, but they made sure that he, was, he wasn't going to be hounded or killed or anything like that because of what his mother had done. But he disappeared into obscurity after that. And no, none, none of her papers ever emerged. So I think the whole lot just got destroyed. So that's the reason why you get, you find yourself as a researcher caught between mountains of information on one hand and very little information on the other hand. And then you have to use common sense and whatever else it takes to kind of figure out what possibly, what was the likely thing that happened. Um, it's about using it. And I think historians have done this as well. I mean, I was luckily not writing a serious documented history. But historians have also struggled with this, that there is very little information on to balance the picture out. Uh, ma uh, Thank this you, ma'am. Uh, uh, this is a question from my student, Sam Daniel. He considers himself as an upcoming novelist. Oh, good. <laughs> he asks for your advice. Just general advice about yeah. becoming a novelist. Yeah. I, I wish I, you know, I didn't have to sound negative because it's a career for myself as a novelist and I would very much like to encourage other people. But what I do want to say is that that world has become tougher and tougher and tougher over time. And there are many reasons for that, mostly to do with the publishing industry and the fact that they are struggling against all kinds of odds, against the digital revolution, against all the competitors they have in terms of other entertainment platforms. So, you know, for, for a publisher to continue to survive up against Netflix and Amazon Prime and the films and the, it's just become a very tough world. So um, to set out now, I think one has to have a brilliant story. Obviously it has to be nicely written. Um, there are still agents and people who are looking out for talent. So the thing would be to find a decent agent who can, um, who can sort of, so the main thing would be to finish writing whatever you're doing. There was a time when people could get commissions, when books could get commissioned on the basis of like 50 pages or something. That is very unlikely to happen now. So finish the book, whatever you're writing, finish it, polish it, make it absolutely wonderful and then try and find an agent. Once you have an agent, then, then they look after the rest. It's their job, it's their problem in a way to try and find a publisher because they invest in own time and energy. So they will try and find somebody for you. But um, good story and tell it well. Easier said than done. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Yes Parvati. Have you ever thought of penning your thoughts in the form of a play? Why do you think only male dramatists foreground the literary scenario? I've never thought about plays, to be honest. I have, I once tried writing a radio play, but this was at the time when um, I'd given up my BBC job when I was still thinking in terms of radio. So in my mind was, I didn't want to waste what I had learned about how to broadcast and how to, how to write when you're writing for radio. So I did a very short something and I submitted it and nobody took it very seriously. I don't think it was particularly good, but I've never actually tried writing a play. I think it would be even more difficult to get commissioned. I would think, I mean, it's not an area that I've tried much, I tried my luck with, but it must be even more tough to break into that world. Um, like I said earlier, I think scripting interests me and just as a different skill. 
So if I have the chance to, to work alongside a sort of established script writer, I would find that a very exciting prospect. No, no play, sorry. <laughs> and you're right, Thank this you. is men, not so much in the UK, I think there are women who write uh, plays as well over here. Yeah, next question. Okay, the next one is from Lavanya. Uh, she asks you this question, ma'am. Is there anything that you strongly wanted to write as an author, but the fact that you are a woman restricted you from writing it? Is there anything that you wanted to write like that? Loads of stuff. <laughs> loads and loads of things. <laughs> First of all, you sit there thinking, oh, my mother is not going to be happy with this. Or my husband is going to say, what are you doing? My husband actually doesn't. He doesn't he's, he's better than my mother at this. But um, it, it is, yeah. I mean, I, I think this is when you talk about, we would, I mean, the previous two or three questions have been about male writing and female writing. And, and I think this is one of the, essential problems that women have probably forever will be saddled with. And that is that when a man does something like writing, he's considered a professional. So he's a professional and he's, he's sort of taken on writing and that he's entitled to do that. And he can sit in his little cabin, wherever it is, writing cabin and, or his study and nobody will disturb him and that's sacrosanct and he's doing his job. But if it's a woman, I remember somebody at the Jaipur Literary Festival once said it, so it's not my original, but I love the expression. She said, we women, we're always writing between two whistles of a pressure cooker. So, you know, you basically what she's saying is that you're grabbing time from wherever you can get it. No one's going to come to you and say, oh, you're a writer. I'm going to make sure that you are left alone to just sit and write all day and lavish, you know, this writerly stuff on yourself. So you don't get treated in the same, with the same uh, respect. So you snatch time wherever you can between your mothering duties, your wifely duties, your home domestic duties, and something or the other will emerge somewhere along the way. And I've heard so many women say this, Western women, Indian women, it doesn't take nationality to change that. So um, I'm afraid that is the, the essential crux of the problem that, yeah, you will never be taken as seriously as a male writer. <laughs> uh, so here's one question from Dr. G. Beulah. Uh, Kerala women are comparatively independent and self-sufficient as they follow matrilineal, And they have their rights to stay at their... Uh, houses, a blessing in disguise. As they have written novels on socio-cultural climate, how do you reflect on their independence and courage? Someone needs to mute. Uh, yes. <laughs> please, participants, please, please mute. Maybe you should tell Kavita Arun. Ah, she's muted. Oh, yeah, uh, muted. <laughs> she's coming back off and on. It's a kid playing there, I think. Kerala's matriliny, we touched upon this earlier as well, wasn't it, when I was talking to Professor Rubara. Um, it's a complicated thing. I mean, yes, we. I, I come from the Naya community, which is supposed to be strongly matrilineal and all that. And what I have observed within my own family, actually, and within the last, let's say, three generations, the generations that I know, my, my mother's, my grandmother's generations, um, it's kind of ebbing away. I don't see it as being a particularly strong social system, which, is, which still operates in the way in which it did historically and should have continued. And I, I remember talking to a friend about this recently, uh, questioning it. We were both questioning the fact that why is it disappearing? Where is it going to? Is it, is, it, is it some sort of patriarchy? It's like trickling down from the north or from other states. Um, there's, there are much stronger patriarchal attitudes now in force than they ever were, historically speaking, in Kerala. So, um, it, like I said, within my own family, there's no 
question of um, the daughters just inheriting, for instance, that's just one example of it. Where previously the the daughter, if there was a son and a daughter, it could be the daughter who inherited, and um, you know you get it down from your matric from your mother's line, but um, not anymore. I think now because of you know maybe it's the, the 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 way in which the law has generally changed things in India, you you would be expected to share whatever the family inheritance is. It's shared in a more equal way between the different siblings and. So if the family is well off enough to afford to have two houses, the daughter will get one and the son will get the other. So it is slowly dissipating away. Not that I necessarily think it's a bad thing because, you know, I mean, equality is enshrined in law and all that. It's there for a reason. So fair enough. But um, the, the, the matrilineal, the, the, the strengths of the old matrilineal system were that women never really had to worry about um, their finance. Yeah. And if, if, as Virginia Woolf said, you know, what, what a woman needs is a room of her own, and she also mentions a small income, then I think it was the Kerala matrilineal sort of societies that had it just right. You know, they had, they, they made sure the women had, the, a woman had a room of her own and a small income at the very least. So, um, yeah, I just hope we don't lose that entirely. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, here is another question from Sam Daniel. Uh, do you have any ideas to bring the concepts of emotional intelligence into your novels? I don't know whether you can bring concepts in except through your characters. So essentially, if you wanted uh, to establish how important it is to, to be an emotionally intelligent uh, person, then, then it, it, you basically create characters who who have that um, that's that skill that that capacity empathy whatever so um, everything I think characterization is I would say the most important thing in creating good fiction um, I go on about good story but I think a good story is almost always driven by the characters so if yeah good um, sort of well-rounded characters, full of emotional intelligence, makes for a good story, I think. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, another question from Dr. Nagarajan Velu. Have you ever thought of writing children literature? Not really. It's again something that I, I, um, I shy away from it because I sort of feel there are people doing it so well. I'm not sure I want to try and uh, I know my friend Anita is very good at sort of branching out into, she's done a bit of something for children and a bit of mythological and a bit of, she's much better at uh, casting around, trying different uh, genres. I um, don't know whether it comes from the fact that my own child is, you know, having special needs. We've, it's sort of, it was a different style of parenting that I had to learn and adapt and all of that. So the idea of sitting with a storybook and telling a story, which is, I think a very normal sort of parental experience just passed me by completely. I never had to do it. <laughs> I would, my daughter would hate it if I tried doing it. She wouldn't have the patience to sit and listen to a whole story. So very rarely did, you know, when she was much smaller, did we sit down with the book and try and, and then the, the book, before you knew it, the book would be in two pieces and hurled across the room. So, so it's a, yeah, I think it's possibly something to do with my own experience of being a parent. Bring the corner of the space. People uh, mute things taken off. Please. I thought I was going to be the noisy person sitting on a very busy street. With I don't know whether you can see the buses going up and down, but uh, there are lots of very noisy families in India as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, with that, we have come to the end of this session. Uh, thank you, participants, for your interesting and meaningful questions. Now I request Professor Josiah Emanuel to deliver the vote of thanks. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for patiently answering all the questions, for being with us for two hours continuously, even without taking a break. Thank you so much, ma'am, for being with us this entire session. And I also thank the registered participants for uh, being with us uh, in this uh, first webinar of our Indian literature series. 
Uh, I would also like to thank Dr. M. Dawman Christopher, our principal and secretary, for being the elemental uh, source for uh, all of this to happen. I thank uh, Dr. J. John Seger, uh, head and um, head of the research department, department of English, Dr. J. Paul Jaika, uh, SF coordinator, and I'd also like to acknowledge our former heads of the department here. Uh, Professor R. Nedumaran is here, and Professor Stanley Mohda Stephen, and, and Dr. Dominic Savio. Uh, I, I also thank you all for joining us, sirs. Uh, I'll also extend my thanks to the members of my faculty department who have joined us, and uh, uh, Professor Daniel Rubraj also for making this organize, organizing this so efficiently and effectively. And I also thank uh, my fellow assistant coordinators, uh, Professor G. Charanya and Professor Arabinaya. And uh, that's it, ma'am. So thank you. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, participants. And this is to the participants. Uh, participants, feel, uh, please uh, don't forget to fill up your exit tickets that is now currently being posted in the chat box. Uh, so, sorry, sorry for the interruption again. So please, or unless you post that, uh, you can't receive your certificates for this. So please uh, remember to post that. So uh, we'll give you uh, five minutes for that. So you, you can leave this uh, Zoom meeting after entering uh, your, your exit tickets. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Lovely um, session. Thank you to Zoom. And thank you very much, Professor Rubaraj in particular. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you on behalf of the research department of English and on my personal behalf. I thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. Yeah, say bye -bye and I, I once again invite you to our college after this COVID-19 days. It has been planned on a number of occasions with skillet people in Kodai Canal and American College in Madurai. And it's always been jinxed. That's why I'm so appreciative of Zoom. At least we did manage to get together like this. Yeah, whenever so whenever you, you come to Kerala next year. Huh? I will definitely try. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Participants, the Exit ticket is available in the chat box. Please complete it. Please submit your exit tickets before you leave. Russo, Russo, Thomas Russo. Are they good to put on our gun?
என்ன பண்ணி 